lecture on spontaneous and induced decay of maybe state of waking. <coughs> yeah. uh, so since I uh, described what I am going to talk uh, today about, uh, I will start with our preliminaries. So let's consider uh, a stream uh, which is characterized by just one parameter, it's tension. It describes all its dynamics and uh, mm, uh, the mass of the stream or the piece of the stream is given by the tension times the length. Uh, and let us consider a situation which uh, may occur in a number of problems, for example, in the breakup of the PCD stream with three quarks, when uh, the stream can either break completely or undergo a phase transition to another stream with a lower uh, tension, epsilon 2. And uh, the interface, I, uh, in particular the case when uh, the stream breaks completely, uh, implies epsilon 2 equal to 0. Uh, and the interface, this transition region, uh, has energy associated with it, and I will denote the, the mass of the, the, of the stream as mu. Uh, then clearly, if you consider it, uh, then uh, the stream with tension epsilon 1 is metastable. It would love to break into a lighter stream, but what prevents it to do is the formation of these two uh, ends with the mass to mu, and we can consider the energy of the configuration relative to just the string with the, uh, the tension epsilon 1, uh, when the gap between the ends has the length L, then clearly it's 2 mu, because we have two ends, minus the energy gain, that's epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 times the uh, length of the gap. And so if we plotted uh, the energy as a function of the length of the gap, uh, we'll find that it starts at 2 mu when there is no gap, and then it falls uh, down linearly, uh, having zero at the critical length, which is of course 2 mu over epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. And in order to break, the stream should go under, uh, should undergo tunneling under the barrier. Uh, well, similar situation can be uh, considered for a metastable wall. If instead of a stream, you have a wall uh, with uh, uh, for example, axon wall when uh, kind of film, film, film with uh, uh, energy epsilon, which can break, which can break, and uh, uh, the breakup is prevented by uh, the fact that the hole in the wall has energy associated with the length of its boundary, proportional to the length, and the proportionality is mu, linear tension of the boundary, and the epsilon is the surface tension of the wall. So those are objects, lower dimensional objects, which live in uh, normal four dimensional space. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, at the, uh, the, the leading quasi-classical level, this, uh, this de the, the decays of such objects are quite similar to false vacuum decay. Uh, the, uh, the whole process of tunneling is described by the same equations. And also, uh, Schwinger uh, process, uh, that is creation of electron-positron pair uh, in the elect electric field. Uh, and uh, the uh, exponents are given by uh, the expressions that uh, we discussed yesterday. However, uh, the pre-exponential factors uh, in uh, such processes are uh, somewhat different from uh, a priori, are somewhat different from what happens uh, uh, in, in the decay of the false vacuum or uh, the Schwinger pair creation. And the reason is that uh, in order to calculate the pre-exponential factor, we have to take into account all the fluctuations around the cl cl classical tunnel in trajectory. And the fluctuations in the case of false vacuum decay, you know, there are no extra degrees of freedom, no extra dimensions. Uh, whereas, say, in the case of string, uh, or breakup of a stream, there is a motion of the string in perpendicular directions. And when the end 
connecting the strings with the uh, uh, tension epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 moves in perpendicular direction, but not only the motion of the mass associated with the uh, interface, but also uh, uh, this uh, interface drags a part of the string, and that, and that effect of dragging extra mass of the string should be taken into account. And uh, this can be done by considering uh, 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 this effect can be calculated. And uh, in order to do the calculation, one should uh, consider the world shape of a string, this is a string with epsilon 1, that it lies along one of the axes and the other axis is time. Uh, and uh, a quasi-classical configuration is uh, a, a, a spot, a, a region occupied by string 2. Uh, and, and this is, of course, a uh, space and the action is given by epsilon 1 times the area occupied by the upper string plus epsilon 2 times the area of the spot and plus uh, the you know, tension of the interface times the perimeter of the interface and of course the minimum of this uh, is uh, the classical uh, problem of finding uh, minimal perimeter of uh, given area maximum area and the configuration is given by a circle in radius of the new over the And the action uh, it, it is easier to uh, calculable and it's uh, just the same as in the case of two dimensional false vacuum decay. Uh, now, uh, in order to uh, take into account the uh, fluctuations, one should split the fluctuations in the longitudinal, that's deformation of the shape of the circle in the plane of the world shape of the initial string and perpendicular degrees of freedom. The fluctuations which are longitudinal in the plane give the same factor as uh, in uh, the uh, false vacuum decay, it's uh, exactly the same problem, whereas the perpendicular, uh, taking into account perpendicular degrees of freedom, is a little bit more uh, tricky. It's, uh, uh, it's quite recent. And it introduces a factor, a dimensionless factor, in the rate of the stream decay. So this would be for only the longitudinal part. It creates only this difference in epsilon 0 to 5. Uh, the uh, perpendicular. Uh, degrees of freedom introduce a factor which is a function of epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. Uh, and uh, you know, when the uh, um, epsilon 2 is close to epsilon 1, this factor is equal to 1. When epsilon 2 goes to 0, that's complete breakup of the stream. It's uh, some number made of the place of nature of logs of pi. However, you see that although uh, the expression looks a little bit uh, involved, the, uh, numerically, uh, it's not very dramatic. Uh, the, uh, uh, actually, all the complexity of this is hidden in one parameter. The parameter mu r is not the parameter mu which, we, uh, which is introduced in the bare Lagrangian, but it's the renormalized tension of the string. It's the no, uh, sorry, not tension, but the mass of the end of the stream. In other words, uh, the, uh, if the effect of the dragging of the string by the end introduces extra mass associated with the string, and that's the only measurable quantity in such a problem. And that is, that is the uh, renormalized mass which uh, uh, is associated with the motion of the end of the string or the interface between two phases of the string. So all the uh, divergences which are associated with this perpendicular motion are uh, in, uh, hidden in this renormal, uh, renormalized uh, tension of the string. Uh, 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 <coughs> and uh, it's not automatic, you see, uh, it's not an automatic uh, property and it holds in the case of string decay or in the case of domain wall decay or axial wall decay. Uh, 
and that uh, the uh, divergences of the, uh, of the theory can all be, uh, of this effective theory, can all be uh, expressed through the physical measurable renormalized tension of the interface. Uh, if one uh, consider uh, the um, metastable brains in higher dimensions, and Professor Gorski will give the next lecture will be about the brains, and will probably not about the metastable ones, uh, this property is lost, and uh, the situation is more complicated. Now, we discussed yesterday catalysis of uh, the uh, of false vacuum decay by particle collisions. And uh, in, during the discussion, I mentioned that uh, although particle collisions do not seem to catalyze uh, the false vacuum decay, what can cat catalyze it is heating of the system. That is enhancing the fluctuations uh, due to the thermal distribution uh, of, of the system over the levels. Uh, at zero temperature, the system is in the ground state, but at finite temperature, uh, it <coughs> stays uh, above the ground one gets excited according to the cubes. Uh, uh, so, uh, the uh, inter uh, introducing temperature in the problem generally changes the rate of uh, the breakup of uh, the stream by a factor, catalysis factor, which depends on the calculation to calculate this uh, Now, uh, the Euclidean formalism of calculation allow, uh, allows to take into account temperature uh, uh, because uh, finite temperature means that instead of calculating the path integral over um, uh, an infinite Euclidean space or quasi infinite, we calculate the uh, same integral on the surface which is periodic in time with period equal to the inverse temperature. Now, clearly, uh, there is a big difference between low temperature and higher temperature. Low temperature means that the period is large, and our circle, the quasi classical configuration, has finite size. So, periodic boundary conditions means that uh, in the time direction, it's a cylinder. So, as uh, the temperature can be considered as low. Uh, as long as uh, the circle fits on the cylinder. In, in another case, as long as its diameter is shorter uh, than the period of the cylinder, one over temperature. Uh, when this is lost, when the temperature is larger, uh, the uh, regime of the uh, breakup of the transition changes. Instead of quantum fluctuations, uh, the system becomes uh, is described by essentially classical thermal uh, dynamics, the thermal fluctuations. So, uh, now, uh, as long as uh, the circle fits on the cylinder, nothing happens to its area and to the calculation at the exponential level, so gamma, uh, which is uh, in gamma zero. What changes, however, are the fluctuations, because the fluctuations should satisfy boundary conditions, and those boundary conditions are now periodic in time. And periodic in time means that we can consider uh, the system which is repeated in time with a period equal to 2 beta. And the modes, uh, the modes of the fluctuation um, around you know, each of these circles, they repeat itself in, and they overlap. They overlap. And there is a matrix. The modes, uh, in, in the case of the circle, because of the symmetry, rotational symmetry, one can expand uh, the modes in uh, uh, harmonics, uh, in angular harmonics. And then the symmetry ensures that they do not overlap. This is not the case when we have periodic condition, the uh, harmonics with different uh, angular momentum around the center of each circle overlap with the harmonics uh, with uh, generally different momenta in the, uh, around the other side. And this leads to the uh, uh, appearance of a factor, which is uh, just the matrix of overlap 
of the harmonics, which is uh, denoted here as D, and it can, cal it can cal be calculated explicitly, I mean, uh, it's element PK of this matrix, as if it's an infinite matrix, it can be running from, uh, one to, uh, from zero to infinity. Uh, it's an infinite matrix, and the catalysis factor is given by inverse, this negative power, D minus two, uh, is the number of perpendicular dimensions. For example, if we have a string uh, in, uh, in uh, 3 plus 1 dimensions, then uh, D is equal to 4. The string is one dimensional object, and there are two perpendicular uh, directions. So that is given for minus 2, which essentially counts the number of degrees of perpendicular degrees of freedom. And the catalysis factor is given by <coughs> inverse of the determinant as usual for Bosonic path integral to the power of the number of these uh, fields for the harmonics. Uh, well, uh, we did not succeed to calculate it analytically, but we can calculate it with arbitrary uh, uh, accuracy numerically. And uh, this factor depends on the parameter RT, where R is the radius of the circle. So when uh, R is one half of, uh, when RT is uh, equal uh, to uh, one half, uh, then that's when the, uh, when the circle starts touching itself on the other side of the cylinder. And this uh, overlap matrix, the determinant of the overlap matrix and the resulting catalysis factor, displays just this behavior uh, 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 as a function of uh, this uh, product RT. So one half is the critical point. And uh, here are two curves uh, calculate, uh, calculated for uh, different values of this RT level. Less than what happened, uh, the difference between curves are that uh, they are for different values of the parameter B. Uh, this is uh, in the case of uh, complete breakup epsilon 2 equal to 0, B is equal to 1. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, actually the determinant explodes, uh, well, the inverse of the determinant explodes at the critical point, as we uh, would have expected. Uh, now, what is interesting, however, is the expansion. You, you can see that. Uh, the matrix with large values of P and K uh, expands uh, in the powers of RT, or the powers of temperature, uh, to power K plus P. So in order to find the first thermal corrections, it's sufficient to consider the lowest values of uh, K and P, namely 1. And one can find the first term of expansion of the catalysis factor in terms of the temperature and this critical length or the diameter of the circle, critical length or the radius of the circle. And uh, to our surprise, we can see that uh, the first term of expansion of the catalysis factor starts with the heat power of the temperature. So this is the zero temperature, one uh, by definition, and the first thermal effect is t to the eight. And at first, it sounds surprising. Why is it t to the eight? Why is the eight power of the temperature at low temperature? Uh, and here, one should stop and think what is what uh, in terms of microscopic processes are uh, the thermal uh, effects. And in terms of, my, of the microscopic processes, uh, it's the, the decay of the string not, in the not from the ground state, but from the excited states. And what are the excitations of the string at low temperature? Uh, there are waves, massless waves running along the string corresponding to waves of uh, uh, deviation in the perpendicular direction. Say a string uh, in the three plus one dimension has two polarizations for such uh, deviation. And uh, th uh, those are massless particles running, uh, can be viewed as massless particles running along the string. And so it, uh, uh, which are Goldstone bosons, why Goldstone bosons? Because, see, initially uh, the string can be anywhere, there is tra translational invariance. 
once the string is placed at some uh, coordinates, the translation and in, uh, invariance is spontaneously broken. And uh, according to Goldstone theory, this leads to emergence of uh, massless excitations. Uh, and so it, uh, a small but finite temperature, uh, the string contains a gas of those waves running along the string of the Goldstone bosons. And the thermal effect is the effect of breaking the string in collisions of those bosons. Uh, and uh, uh, then we can understand why it's eight, uh, eight power of the temperature. Uh, if we d uh, consider deviation of the uh, definiteness in one direction, let's call it Z, of, uh, which is a function of the coordinate along the string of time, to be the field of uh, uh, describing such Goldstone, then we realize the following. That nothing can, uh, that the probability of breakup of the string cannot depend on Z itself. Yes, please. Yes, sure. Waves running along the string, and they, if you wish, they concentrate some energy. And the tunneling critically depends on the energy. So if they transfer energy to the degree of freedom which describes the tunnel, then it, it, it enhances the world. On the string, one, one, one running this way, the other running this way. Like, it's an ideal collider. The string is an ideal collider, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to collimate anything. Uh, so, nothing can depend on the constant value of the shift of the string in the uh, perpendicular direction, because it's just a shift. Also, nothing can depend on the first derivative of the shift, because linear shift, uh, linear in the uh, shift uh, of the string is just a rotation of the string, right, by uh, a finite angle. And therefore, it's only the second derivative which can uh, uh, determine the amplitude of the process. Uh, the second derivative means that uh, in terms of the uh, energy or the momentum, which are the same for massless particles, uh, uh, each particle comes with the fact in the amplitude, with the factor omega squared. Right? Uh, now, uh, as we all know from calculating uh, amplitudes, probabilities here, there is a normalization factor one, of, one over square root of energy per each particle, right? And therefore, each uh, Goldstone boson uh, comes in the amplitude of any process actually uh, uh, with the factor omega to power three halves, uh, and therefore omega cubed in the probability per each of them. If there are two of them, then it's omega to the sixth. Okay? Uh, omega one times omega two to the sixth. And if we consider the minimal process with n equals two, then uh, we have Goldstones, which are um, uh, uh, distributed according to both the Einstein distribution, just like the photons, except that they are moving in one direction. Uh, and uh, we have probability which depends on uh, uh, the product of their frequencies as this product Q. So I make a one Q, I make a two Q, uh, uh, I'm sorry, double two is I mean proportional to I make a one Q, I make a two Q. And uh, the probability of the uh, process in the thermal equilibrium is given by the integral with the uh, statistical weight for omega-1 and omega-2 over omega-1 and omega-2. So we have here eight powers of omega. We have six powers of omega in W2, three per each particle. And we have d omega-1, d omega-2. And since omega is proportional to temperature, in thermal equilibrium, we have temperature to the eighth power. And doing this simple exercise, we can easily find the coefficient c by comparing with our expression for the catalysis. Yeah. We can find the coefficient C, and therefore we can find 
the uh, cross section, if you wish, although it's in one dimension, it's not cross section. They cannot miss each other. It's the probability. When they collide, they break up the string. We can find this coefficient explicitly for low energy expansion. <coughs> so, uh, and here is the result, but there are higher powers of uh, S. Uh, this is the invariant in the collision of two particles, but uh, it is reduced to the product of the one and the two. And the uh, what makes it dimensional less is the radius of the critical circle. Uh, so it's powers of R squared times S uh, on which W. So it depends that we know the first term of expansion. Uh, well, we would like to know higher terms of expansion. Yes, fourth, fifth, and so on. Uh, uh, it would be tricky to extract it from the uh, expression that I showed you for the temperature dependence because in the higher powers of uh, temperature, uh, there is tangling uh, between higher powers of the energy for, say, two uh, Goldstone boson collisions and lower powers of the energy in the expression for the probability of breakup of a string in the multi boson collisions, in four boson collisions. So one should somehow untangle the number of bosons from the higher powers of the expansion in the energy. And this can be done. This can be done by controlling the density of the Goldstone bosons. Uh, and that means introducing chemical potential. So introducing in the system an energy uh, which it costs to make a Goldstone boson. Normally, uh, you would not do that, because chemical potential can be introduced only for particles whose number is conserved. Ghosts and bosons, in their collisions, they don't conserve their number. But here, here, we are uh, not looking for the Ghosts and boson collisions or rescattering themselves. So we're looking for a third, we're, we're choosing a thermal ensemble, and are looking for a, a, a rare process that's break up of the stream. So we are not including the processes where, say, two Goldstone bosons produce four Goldstone bosons. That is B. But uh, we are preparing an ensemble uh, of uh, the bosons uh, with the chemical potential. And uh, then the powers of exponent of minus uh, nu over T give us the uh, powers of the density of the Goldstone bosons. And since uh, say, uh, the probability in collision of two Goldstone bosons will contain two, such, uh, two powers of this exponent, uh, and the collisions with, uh, of four Goldstone bosons will have four powers of this exponent, we should be, easy to, we, we should be able to easily distinguish. Uh, then uh, the calculation before is, modified, uh, which I showed before, is modified really, actually very easily, and the only extra factor is uh, arising here are uh, the uh, logarithm, uh, polylogarithm functions of this exponent, and one can easily uh, determine the powers of uh, the density and find, uh, and find well, whatever one likes. Uh, the expression for the catalysis factor in terms of this modified matrix, and now we, if it is expanded in powers of this matrix, uh, each power can, uh, corresponds to one power of the density of the Goldstone. So this expression would correspond to two Goldstones, the next four Goldstones, and so on. And what is interesting here is that only even number, even uh, powers of this density matrix enter the expansion. And therefore, uh, the string is destroyed only in collisions of even number of Goldstones, say in collisions of three or five. Uh, it's not destroyed, and we don't know what the reason is. Uh, there is no symmet apparent symmetry which forbids breakup of a stream and collision of odd numbered uh, L stones. Now, uh, 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 and? what does it precisely mean that uh, string is destroyed? Destroyed, that means the fall. <laughs> Uh, string can destroy itself just because it can, because there is a state with lower energy. Okay. 
uh, and uh, it does it with low probability. Heating the string or colliding goldstones on the string concentrate energy in a smaller region and facilitate the breakup. So that's what I mean by breakup. It's not that you know, they will break up necessarily, but the probability is higher depending on the energy of the goldstone balls. And uh, 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 if one picks any term of this expansion, say quadratic term, or quartic term, or any other term, it's a smooth function of the temperature, and therefore uh, there is no phase uh, so no sign of the phase transition that I discussed, uh, well, no sign of critical point in uh, the collision of any number of gold stones, any finite number of uh, gold stones. So uh, none of the individual process is responsible for uh, the appearance of the critical point when uh, the um, uh, uh, circle wraps out around the cylinder. Uh, and uh, the critical point uh, arises be because all the terms of this expansion become simultaneously important to the critical point, all the processes. So it's not the individual process, but the multitude of the processes which gives rise to the critical point. Of course, one can find, uh, the, uh, by doing this, and say picking the two goldstone terms, this is the second power, one can work out easily the uh, expression, general expression, for uh, the probability as a function of this parameter uh, omega 1, omega 2 times r squared, square root of x times r, and uh, find, uh, actually, uh, one can find out that it it's given by a square of a function whose expansion uh, in powers of its argument is known explicitly. And for certain values of uh, this parameter b, uh, which I remind you is 1 uh, when the string breaks completely, this function phi 1 is the third Bessel function. So one gets uh, a closed expression. The Bessel function uh, at high values of the argument high values of the argument uh, becomes uh, exponent, as we all know. And that exponent, uh, uh, and uh, this is the probability of breakup of the string and collision of two tall stones. And before, we discussed uh, the uh, catalysis of uh, decay by collisions of particles at the, uh, at the level of the exponent, not at the level of pre-exponent. So the exponential behavior of uh, this factor at large uh, energy, at large S, actually matches the quasi-classical consideration at large energy that we discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, I'll skip with the stable wall decay. It doesn't contain anything new. And Schwinger pair creation. Of course, we don't have too many relativistic strings around. Only Consider them, for example, in heavy flavor QCD as a, as a toy, as a theoretical uh, model. But what we can uh, envisage more uh, readily is the creation of uh, electron positron pairs in a capacitor, in a good capacitor, in a large big field. Uh, now, the, uh, of course, the dynamics is exactly the same uh, if we consider a configuration of electron and positron uh, separated by L, distance L in the electric field, so <coughs> separated by the electric field uh, uh, by distance L, uh, then uh, again the energy is twice the mass of the electron minus the work done by the field. So uh, E times the electric field plays the role of tension. And there is a critical uh, length where the work done by the field on the pair exceeds to, uh, the uh, loss in the energy of twice the mass of the electron. Uh, so the process uh, uh, goes by tunneling. It was first calculated by Fritz Sauter in 1929. Uh, the full pre-exponent was calculated by Schwinger in 51. 
And uh, the process contains this exponent of mass of electron square divided by the electric field, that's E. And the critical field when the exponent becomes a order one is approximately 10 to the 16th volts per centimeter, which is very big. A million volts per, uh, per centimeter would break. Gum? I, I think it was about the same time, maybe plus or minus a year, but you are obviously interested in whether it's plus or minus. No, people knew about, people knew about tunneling, but people knew about tunneling. Yeah. WKB calculations were uh, they were always known. It's it's 26, 1926. So. Yeah, but that is ap application. I know. Yeah, uh, uh, but that is for alpha. Uh, that's for alpha decay. It's different. It's impossible to charge a real capacitor so that the field uh, gets to those values. Uh, but one can create, well, well, people are thinking about creating fields which are approaching this uh, by in the intersection of uh, uh, 10 to second laser beams. Uh, with regards to this process, those fields can be considered as static because the lasers are open in the optical range, and that's very slow in comparison with uh, the scale of the electron mass. So those fields can be considered as static. However, practical uh, fields, uh, well, at least what people think of achieving, are still lacking in a factor of about a thousand. And a factor of about a thousand in the exponent is a, a big zero. It was suggested. Uh, it was suggested that maybe one can gain by shining a low power but high frequency uh, photon beam on this uh, region of the electric field. Yeah? Then the uh, high frequency, weak but high frequency field, can transfer energy to the the electron position pair and facilitate the pair reach. So the problem then <coughs> boils down to calculating uh, the uh, creation of pairs by a single photon in the vacuum. It's impossible to, you know, because of the energy and moment of conservation of it. cannot produce electron positron pair, but in the electric field it can do it because the energy is supplied by the electric by the external uh, strong electric field, and that amounts to calculating a photon uh, propagator in external electric field, and uh, which develops an imaginary part for a real photon, one case where it is zero on mass shell. Uh, such a polarization operator is known in principle, but it is known in a quite complicated integral form. So any practical calculation of a form from this integral is a separate a big scientific work. Uh, however, it turns out that the physically interesting results uh, can be found by simple semi-classical calculation without going through that. Uh, uh, that uh, Integral with mathematical functions. Uh, first of all, one should notice that an electric field, a uniform constant electric field, is Lorentz invariant under uh, the uh, under boosts along the field. Therefore, whatever photon uh, is uh, directed towards the field, it's only the perpendicular component of the photon momentum which matters, because any longitudinal component can be eliminated by by the boost. Or, in other words, in terms of uh, incident angle theta its uh, angle between the direction of the incident photon and the field, uh, it's omega times sine theta, uh, you know, the parameter on which the probability can decay. Now, <coughs> omega sine theta 
can be compared with different quantities. What's the parameter for the enhancement if it exists? It's either omega, uh, uh, of course one should multiply omega by the biggest distance scale. And the biggest distance scale of this problem is the critical length. That is mass times, uh, mass divided by the electric field. <coughs> if we multiply it by quantum wavelength of the electron, say omega over mass, then in, in the weak fields that, that would be much smaller. So this is the biggest parameter, it's called Keldish parameter. We should be right for all the forget but we may push the long direct no, 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 no. Perpendicular, no, no. It's perpendicular, of course not. You, no, you don't generate magnetic field. You generate only if you boost perpendicular to electric field. You, gener you generate magnetic field which is perpendicular to both your boost and the electric field. Think in terms of invariance, c squared minus b squared, and you don't be. If you boost along the uh, electric field, in which direction be? Th there or there? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. OK. Uh, uh, now, uh, so omega over mass is small, but uh, this uh, Kempish parameter uh, uh, can, be R, uh, can, can be considered as R. Uh, so, uh, and there is also separate behavior of the enhancement. Uh, with respect, um, uh, uh, depending on the polarization of the foot, with respect to the electric field. Uh, and so there is a parallel uh, polarization operator, this imaginary part of polarization operator, and perpendicular. So there are two options, as we know, for the two polarizations. Uh, just in the same way, instead of doing complicated integrals, one can do uh, high school <coughs> electrostatics. Uh, the uh, tunnel in trajectory for the Schwinger processors, outer processors, just in a circle, electron moving in a circle in Euclidean space. Consider it a thermal bath. Then one should consider circles which are placed with the uh, period uh, beta, which is uh, in the inverse of the temperature. And so there is a current flowing in each of these circles. And there is an interaction. If there are currents flowing, then there is interaction between currents. Now well, there are interactions of two types. There is interaction within the circle, but that does not depend on beta. That, that does not depend on the temperature. And actually, that describes the radiative correction to the Schwinger uh, exponent. And it was cal calculated by Jan Nathalie Kalvaritz and Manta back in 82. It's very simple. What is interesting, the temperature dependent effect, is the interaction of the currents. And it's a lot simpler. It's a simpler to calculate <coughs> because when there is uh, the interaction between two currents, is just a simple problem for classical electrodynamics. Uh, and one can find the change in the action per period in terms of the temperature and the radius of this orbit. Uh, and the radius of this orbit. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, we realize that heating the temperature means putting uh, the system in a bath with photons. We're accounting for uh, electromagnetic fields floating around, and in a bath, uh, the fields are the fields of photons. And <coughs> the, uh, uh, the correction to the uh, decay rate contains exponent of minus uh, the change in the action per period. And the change in the action is, of course, contains E squared, because it's the interaction of the currents which carry each given the charge E. And therefore, uh, the uh, effect we are looking for actually sits in this delta S because the polarization operator for a photon uh, also contains just two vertices, two vertices for the external photon. 
uh, and uh, it's uh, of the same order in E. So instead of uh, going to uh, that trick with chemical potential, we can simply count the powers of E, and we can do the same. We, since we know the effect, we know the photon distributions, uh, we can compare the coefficients of expansion, of thermal expansion, for the photon, uh, in the photon bath, and in our little calculation, and find the uh, expression for uh, the uh, catalysis factor by the photon as a function of uh, the, the, the biggest effect is for the parallel polarization as a function of the Keldish parameter gamma theta. It's given again by the square of the Bessel function, in this case, of the first Bessel function, which is related to difference behavior of small organisms. Uh, we can also uh, <coughs> calculate the, uh, directly the polarization operator as a correlator of currents uh, on such circle, not, go, uh, uh, not going through the uh, thermal calculation. It's about the same. We can uh, uh, calculate this polarization operator by considering the action uh, for the current carried by uh, the electron, and then the uh, the, integra uh, the uh, integra integration over uh, the variables uh, in the path integral is uh, simply the integration over the position of the circle. So if you have two points where you measure the current, only those points correlate, which uh, can be connected by the circle. So it's a simple geometric exercise. It's a cl classical current, and all the fluctuations are just the shifts. So only points wh which can be connected by the circle carry the correlator and gives the same expression in terms of the Bessel uh, And finally, uh, one can also calculate the leading effect in the perpendicular by uh, considering uh, by the perpendicular polarization, perpendicular to the electric field, which shifts the electron out of the plane of uh, the circle. So if the field is in x direction uh, and the polarization is in the z direction, there is a shift in the z direction, and this is real, uh, this is more real quantum fluctuation, uh, the, the result is also expressed in terms of the uh, Bessel function. Uh, and there is also a contribution which was not known, uh, which was not extracted from that uh, complicated expression for the polarization operator, which is associated with the magnetic moment of, of the electron, which can also be calculated in this way. Uh, now, <coughs> the expressions that uh, I showed so far uh, assume that the energy of the photon is not large of this uh, weak beam, weak in power but high frequency, is not large in comparison with the mass of the electron. So one would think that let's crank up the uh, energy of the photon to few MeV and then we would create waves. No, it's not the case. What was, uh, as, uh, when the energy is much smaller than the mass of the electron, one can neglect the momentum that the photon uh, uh, transfers, uh, gives to the pair. Right? Because the, uh, the uh, energy associated with the motion of the pair as a whole is momentum squared over mass. So it's, and the momentum is the energy of the photon. Uh, and uh, so when energy is small, it's small. When the energy of the photon becomes comparable to mass, then there are two opposing uh, factors that contribute. One is uh, that the photon uh, gives its energy to the tunneling trajectory of electron and positron. But it also requires the energy of the final state to be higher because of the momentum conservation in the direction perpendicular to the electric field. Right? So the pair should emerge uh, with, uh, with the momentum, and that requires more energy. So the photon gives energy, but requires 
more energy to be spared in the turbine. Yeah. And uh, uh, this can be, this corresponds to deformation of the trajectory of the circle in the, in the Z direction, and which changes the action. The change in the action exactly corresponds to the uh, to this change uh, requiring energy requirement due to the momentum conservation. And it turns out that indeed, by increasing the energy of the photon, one can uh, increase uh, the probability. But this increase is <coughs> very weak. So the exponential factor, the exponential factor which starts as pi m squared over e e in the exponent, uh, minus sign, turns into a factor which depends on the ratio of this perpendicular momentum of the photon, which is as before everything depends, over twice the mass of the electron. So the idea is that when x is bigger than 1, the exponent should go down. Yes, indeed, it goes down if one analyzes this little expression. It goes down, but it goes down as 1 over x. It goes down very weakly as 1 over x. And that is because those two effects, the supply of the energy to the pair and the requirement of it to have a momentum, uh, compete and compensate each other. Uh, the net effect is, is an enhancement, but a weak enhancement proportional to 1 over x. So if the electric field available is, uh, say, 1,000 times smaller than m squared than the critical field, which is m squared, uh, then one needs this parameter x, the perpendicular momentum over twice the mass over m e b. Uh, a factor of a thousand. So you need a GeV photon beam to make this exponent of order. But then it becomes not very really spectacular. It's not very really interesting. Although still interesting. GeV photons is not something non existing. No, 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 not something non But you see, when you hit GeV photon, and produce a plus and minus pairs, that, that doesn't sound very spectacular. It's, it, it's a, a lot less spectacular than if you just charge a capacitor and see electrons and positrons coming. Yeah, yeah. In, in those cases. Uh, okay, I, uh, I am done. I am done and ready to answer questions. density and the tension are equal. But in the particle physics? In the, in the particle physics? Ah, okay, okay, particle okay. Well, why is all this? Well, people are discussing all sorts of models of, say, supersymmetric QCD uh, or supersymmetric young mass theories, which have such objects. They, they have st uh, strings, moreover strings with different uh, tension and with monopoles sitting so it's not that example that I can show you as a demonstration. It's an example which is present in, uh, 
in the writing so far. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, uh, all, and also, um, as I said before, uh, yesterday, you can think of the string as uh, no, one picture of confinement in, in confinement in QCD is that instead of having column like field spread around between two sources, the um, uh, gl 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 gluoelectric field is uh, concentrated in the tube, which at large length is a string. You don't observe it at large length. It breaks due to creation of light points. But suppose there were no light points, only top points. Then we should stretch it very long before it's energetically possible at all. But even if it is energetically possible, if we have long enough streams so that it has, it has energy to produce the content, it won't do it for quite a while because of the separation. Now consider it uh, heated, such stream. Okay. So when, when it is just stretched, there are waves running uh, along it. Waves are running for a simple reason, because if I pluck it, if I deviate it somewhere, it is, I, uh, locally increase the energy. Just uh, the uh, fluctuation it, of the energy density in the space, uh, or what are these Goldstone bosons? The Goldstone bosons are no. on the on the QCDs. It's yeah, it's a simple exercise. Suppose you have an arbitrary shape of the stream, right? Which is z of x and t. It's deviation of the string as a function of x. And t. You write the length string as a, uh, as a function. And then uh, you expand it and you, you will have a derivative of z squared uh, times dx for the action. Derivative of z squared is the uh, action of the Lagrangian for a massless particle. Maybe I can write condition at the ends. <laughs> it's just the right place for me to put it. Then, uh, what's the length of the string? The, uh, the length is, uh, the length of the string is uh, integral of square root of 1 plus uh, d, d squared d, right? Where dc is the gradient both uh, spatial in time. And, uh, and the action, the action is epsilon times the So now I, I expand it's epsilon times the integral of 1 dx at the uh, action for Lagrangian. If I wrote dt, it would be epsilon. Uh, times integral for dx, that is the uh, length of a straight string, plus uh, epsilon over q integral d z squared dx, and this is the action for, uh, or the Lagrangian for massless fields. Okay. More questions? When is this? If epsilon, it uh, doesn't look like a standard Lagrangian massless field. Epsilon should be one, isn't it? Yeah, it's the, just the normalization. Uh, yeah. Let me define the sigma. It, it, it's a matter of how you define uh, the normalization. Z has dimension of length, but I can always define sigma can it be that epsilon will be some function? Huh? Can it be that uh, epsilon uh, is uh, some function arbitrary? Of what? Uh, I don't know of, of, of the x. Of x? Uh, well, uh, then it would be, uh, it would not be what's usually considered to be a relativistic string per se. It can be. It, it can be. So it can be. 
a function of perpendicular coordinate. And there is an example uh, in uh, crystals, dislocations in crystals. A dislocation is a line which is sitting in the crystal potential. So uh, the, it's not epsilon which is a function, the tension of the dislocation is not a function of the coordinate, but there is an extra potential depending on z. Because, and it's periodic, because if I shift it, uh, crystal period, it the same. Uh, epsilon, I don't know examples, but probably one can work out. Okay, uh, that's it. That is all.